Why in the world should you be concerned with any of this, let alone spending your time studying a topic like statistics? I hear this all the time. Well, maybe you want to uh, do research as a profession or be a statistician. More likely, you just want to avoid a mundane job or a scary job or a disgusting job or a downright stupid job. Or maybe, just maybe, you don't want to lose your home because having better math skills has been linked with less likely to foreclose. This study showed that people with poor math skills had a higher probability of being foreclosed on during the recent uh, housing crash. But then again, maybe you would like to be a statistician. They make a lot of money and there are a lot of jobs out there. But I agree with you. It's not the greatest job for everybody. So again you might ask if I don't want to be a statistician or a researcher why should I worry about this stuff? Well just having some sort of statistical thinking and being able to think analytically about numbers is very important for just being an effective citizen because we're always always being bombarded with stats. We are consumers of research results whether you're reading the paper or a research journal you're gonna hear stats or read stats all the time and you need to be able to spot the bad ones. That being said here's a bad one. So consider this statistic which is a direct quote from a scientific publication written by a doctoral student and reviewed by several very well educated PhDs. This is what we call a peer-reviewed uh, journal. And yet nobody caught this. So every year since 1950 the number of American children gunned down has doubled. Let's consider that for a second. Let's assume that for the sake of making the math as easy as possible that only one child was gunned down in 1950. And then let's see what happens to the numbers. So in 1950 we have 1, by 54 it's gone to 16. By 1965 the number is over 1 million. And in fact in 1965 the FBI had only identified 9,960 total homicides in the entire country. By 1980, the number would have passed 1 billion, which at the time was more than four times the total U.S. population. In 1987, the total would have been over 137 billion. That's billion with a B, which happens to be larger than the estimated total human population throughout the entire history of time. Granted, we have no idea what that number is, but estimates put it at about 110 billion. In 1995, when this horrible statistic was published, the total would have been over 35 trillion, which is more than a hundred times the estimated number of stars in our galaxy. Now you might ask, how the hell do we know how many stars there are in the galaxy? We don't, again it's an estimate, but the current estimate is much smaller than the number of kids gunned down in 1995. Alright, so let's look at the, the quote again. Every year since 1950 the number of American children gunned down has doubled. Where did that come from? Well, it actually came from this direct quote, uh, uh, a study done by the Children's Defense Fund. You can look this up. It was published. The State of America's uh, Children Yearbook in 1994 stated that the number of American children killed each year by guns has doubled since 1950. Sounds the same. Let's look at them side by side. So every year since 1950 the number has doubled versus the number killed each year has doubled since 1950. Can you see how the one on the bottom is saying that it's doubled once since 1950 whereas the one on the top says it's doubled every year. 
So a very simple rearranging of words all of a sudden makes this statistic horribly, horribly wrong. And the reason why is uh, the, the student who put this in their paper was just trying to avoid a direct quote. They thought they could reword it and get away with it, and they obviously did a horrible job of it. This statistic uh, is in this book by uh, Dr. Joel Best called Damned Lies and Statistics. It's a great book. It's very funny. You don't need to be a statistician or have math skills to read it. He just talks about this and other great examples of really bad stats. And he claims that that one, in his opinion, is the worst stat ever, and I tend to agree. Another uh, really bad stat that's in his book was one quoted in the 1980s by Mitch Snyder, who was an advocate for the homeless, who said that 45 homeless people die every minute in the United States. This, again, was a, a stat that nobody checked, and the media picked it up, and it was reported over and over and over again. You'll still be able to find it if you look for it. Let's look at the numbers. So let's say 45 homeless people die each minute. With some simple um, multiplication, you get over 23 million homeless people dying every year. So with just a little modicum of uh, common sense, you'd be able to call him out for a BS artist. Another one of his uh, wonderful statistics was that 3 million homeless, there are there were at the time in 1980 a total of 3 million homeless. That was his stat. And again, quoted time and time again, you can still find it uh, being quoted in journals today. So that went around a long time until finally Ted Koppel on Nightline kind of badgered him on it, called him on it over and over again, asked him, what are your sources, what are your sources, and he finally admitted that he just made it up. He said that in order for people to pay attention, he figured at least 1% of the population needed to be affected. The current population was roughly 300 million, so he took 1% of that and said 3 million homeless. So any other facts we should question? Absolutely. There are loads and loads of them. I know the examples I've given have all been kind of on a liberal slant, so you might think that I'm a big fat conservative uh, trying to show how the liberals always lie, and that's not the case at all. Those just happen to be some of the uh, more, shall we say, entertaining examples of bad stats. But um, there are plenty of examples on the right as well. This book by Al Franken uh, points out a myriad of bad, bad stats that the conservative uh, media likes to uh, throw at you and if you Google search yourself you will find uh, many examples on both sides of the aisle so again you might ask yourself do I want to be a researcher probably not so why should I bother with this stuff well as we've said before common sense is not so common anymore and in order to have some common sense we need a little technical information in order to make those judgments and nowhere is that lack of common sense or lack of technical prowess more evident than when people try to deal with probabilities here are some probabilistic questions that you might want to try and investigate in an actual business setting so there are applications in the business world. Unfortunately, we don't do probability too well. Here's a great example. It's called the Monty Hall problem or uh, the let's make a deal problem. You'll find it online or maybe you've come across it already. If you don't remember what let's make a deal was like, Monty Hall would pick someone, show them three doors, tell them behind one door is a great prize like a new car or a trip somewhere and behind the other two doors is some junk prize called the donkey prize that nobody wants. Ask them to pick a door. So let's say in this case you pick door number one. What Money Hall is going to do is he's going to open up one of the other two doors showing you that there's a bad prize, the donkey prize, behind one of them. And now he asks you, do you stay with door number one or do you switch to door number three? And the big conundrum is, do you stay or do you switch? Well, take a second and think about this. Pause the video if you want and ask yourself, is it better to stay with the first door, switch to the other door, or does it not matter at all? Well, let's look at the numbers. In the beginning, before you know anything at all, you've got a one in three chance of choosing the right door. 
So if you did choose that right door and you switched, you would lose. However, you had a two-thirds chance of picking the wrong door, and if you switched, you would win, because regardless of which of those two wrong doors you chose, he would always open up one of them, and thus your switch would always put you onto the winning door in this case. So, a one-third chance of choosing correctly means when you switch you lose, and a two-thirds chance of choosing incorrectly means when you switch you win. So all in all, if you just follow the simple math, right, one-third of the time switching makes you lose, two-thirds of the time switching means you win. So, you're twice as likely to win if you switch. Human beings are pretty amazing. We've got very powerful brains. In fact, when the next slide comes up, pause the video and read it. Pretty amazing, isn't it? You were able to read that. Now take a closer look and realize that none of those words are, other than the short ones, are spelled correctly. But our brain is able to actually figure it out. But there are some things our brain doesn't do well, like common sense. And common sense needs help from statistics. Statistics is built on probability, so we really need to learn some statistics to get better at probability to help us understand these things. So that brings us back to the initial question of why bother with this? Well, you're going to be bombarded all the time. Polls, studies, surveys, advertisements, all of these things are going to throw stats at you, make claims, try to sway your opinion, try to make you think one way, try to deceive you. Maybe they're doing it on purpose or maybe they're just too stupid to understand how to report stats the right way. But the bottom line is if you learn nothing else from this course, hopefully you will become a better consumer of statistics. You'll be able to spot the lies and spot the bad stats.